A world of modern transportation has greatly enhanced global trade and an overall quality of life. Unfortunately, a consequence of being able to move practically anything, anywhere, has resulted in countless invasive species to every corner of the globe. Over the course of history, there have been many reasons why fish may have been moved from one place to another. Sometimes it's out of entirely good intentions, and others not so much. The 1800s were especially wild times for species introductions, as the environmental impacts of moving and introducing species was very poorly understood. At the time, it was perhaps no more than a thought of, well, instead of just eating trout, let's put carp in the lake so we have trout and carp to eat. And in the modern age, we know the impacts of making a decision like that. However, we can't really blame our ancestors for the choices they made, as it probably seemed like a perfectly good and harmless idea at the time, with the understanding that they had. All things considered, no matter where you are from, it's very likely that whatever lake or river is closest to you 200 years ago was biologically a very different place. Let's take a look at an example close to me. Utah Lake historically held a very large population of Bonneville cutthroat trout as well as June sucker, a species that's found nowhere else on earth. The early settlers relied heavily on the June sucker as a food source until numbers became low and unreliable. Common carp were seen as a hardy, fast-growing alternative that could provide reliable protein for the settlers and the surrounding communities, and they were introduced in the 1880s. Within the next years, numerous sport fish were introduced, including channel catfish, largemouth bass, walleye, and white bass, among a few others. In only 2010, so relatively recently, northern pike were illegally introduced. Long story short, the native species of Utah Lake now make up for less than 1% of the biomass of the lake, as there are virtually no cutthroat, and only a threatened population of June sucker along with limited additional native species. This story is one of many that has occurred over the last two centuries and shaped the aquatic world as we know it. Before I get into specific species, I want to make it clear what an invasive species actually means. Simply stated, an invasive species is something that has been introduced outside of its native range. When most people hear the term invasive species, they think of something like the common carp, which has been brought overseas and has an overall negative impression with most people. What many people don't often recognize is that numerous sport fish that are loved by many are in some cases just as much of an issue. These are the species that tend to be controversial as people place value in different things. The truth of the matter is, even rainbow trout, which is a wonderful fish and loved by most, when found outside of its native range and begins to disrupt and damage the populations and lifestyles of native fish, it essentially is an invasive species. Now, of course there are management plans to try and create a balance of maintaining the coexistence of native species and introduced sport fish, but there are obviously still going to be problems with some of these introductions. So that being said, some of the species in this series of invasive fish will be totally expected, while on the other hand, some species may be very unexpected to some. This video is only part one, so if you don't see a species that you're expecting to, it's likely going to show up in a future episode. The first invasive species that I'd like to discuss is the mosquito fish. The mosquito fish is actually native to parts of the southeastern US and northern Mexico, but it has since been introduced to not only nearly every corner of North America, but all over the entire globe, now being found on every continent except for Antarctica. Only barely growing over two inches, mosquito fish are tiny, but they're incredibly disruptive. 
Known for eating mosquito larvae, they were introduced to control mosquito populations and help prevent the spread of mosquito-borne illnesses like malaria. But instead, they've become a problem themselves. The fact of the matter is that most places already have native fish species that are great at limiting mosquito populations, and mosquito fish in many cases have only made things worse by disrupting these native species that were originally helping keep the mosquito numbers in check. There are some examples of mosquito fish actually helping prevent the spread of malaria, but it really doesn't compensate for the extensive damage that they've caused. Mosquito fish are highly aggressive and compete with native fish for food. Worse, they attack and eat the eggs and larvae of native amphibians. In shallow wetlands, they often outcompete or kill native species outright, reducing biodiversity. Mosquito fish are highly tolerant of poor water conditions, and this allows them to survive nearly everywhere. They are also very successful at reproducing as they reproduce rapidly and give live birth. Whether you recognize it or not, these fish are all around, and if you look for them, it's likely that you'll find them in the water body closest to you. The next fish on the list is pleco. Plecos, also known as armored catfish, are popular aquarium algae eaters. But when they get too big for tanks, they're often dumped into local waterways, and unfortunately they tend to thrive there. These fish are native to the Amazon and Orinoco River basins in South America and therefore they do well in warm tropical waters. So as you can imagine, they are very detrimental in Florida and other parts of the southeastern US. Plecos are harmful because they dig deep burrows into riverbanks, causing severe erosion and sediment runoff, which can smother other fish eggs and aquatic vegetation. They are also competition for other bottom-dwelling species. Also, they don't suffer from predation as much as other species because these fish are extremely well fortified as they are absolutely covered in protective armor. Plecos usually grow around 12 to 18 inches and live for about 10 to 15 years. This next one may surprise a few of you. Brown trout is a fish on this list that many people actually very much enjoy. They were brought over from Europe to North America in the late 1800s for sport fishing. However, they've since become top predators in many streams eating aquatic insects, crustaceans, and even small mammals, impacting species up and down the food chain. Unfortunately, brown trout outcompete native trout species like the cutthroat trout for food and space. Even though the brown trout is a wonderful fish, it's sad when you see a distribution map like this and consider that thousands of streams and habitat, which once held native species, are now dominated by the brown trout. Despite the major impacts that these trout have had on countless streams, they aren't even closely as despised as a few of the other species on this list. Next up is a big one, the species of Asian carp. The species of Asian carp have a huge environmental impact as they can completely alter an ecosystem in devastating ways. Asian carp is a collective term in the US for four invasive species of carp, the silver carp, the big head carp, the grass carp, and the black carp. Each of these carps share a similar story as they all come from a nearly identical native range in eastern China, and currently they all have a pretty similar invasive range as they now impact primarily the Mississippi Basin. The silver carp can grow up to 40 inches and weigh more than 60 pounds. They have a lifespan of about 15 to 20 years. Silver carp are known for leaping far out of the water when startled by boats, making them a hazard to boaters traveling at high speeds. They are filter feeders consuming enormous quantities of plankton, the base of the aquatic food web which ripples throughout the entire ecosystem. Big head carp are similar to silver carp, big, fast growing, and resilient. However, these fish are even bigger than the silver carp, growing to a massive 60 inches and around 100 pounds. They compete directly with native fish and mussels for food. Their massive size and rapid reproduction allow them to outnumber and outcompete native species quickly, often taking over entire river sections. These fish have been known to alter river ecosystems on a massive scale. Grass carp were originally introduced to control weeds as they act like an underwater lawnmower. However, grass carp don't know the difference between problematic species and native plant species, destroying almost any aquatic plants that they encounter. 
As they consume vast amounts of vegetation, this destroys shelter, spawning areas, and food for many aquatic species. Unlike the silver carp and the big head carp, grass carp have a more extensive invasive range and are causing problems in more than just the Mississippi Basin. The black carp have the smallest invasive range of the four Asian carp species, but that doesn't mean that they aren't a problem. Black carp are mollusk specialists. They crush and eat snails and mussels, including many of North America's endangered native species. Since native mussels play a key role in filtering water and cycling nutrients, their decline causes widespread ecosystem problems. Probably most everyone watching this video is familiar with this next one, and that is the common carp. The common carp causes devastation on a much larger scale than these other carp species I've mentioned, as they are found nearly everywhere in North America. The common carp are notorious ecosystem engineers, but not in a good way. Unlike the previous carp species, common carp come from Europe rather than Asia. They are prized fish in many parts of Europe, and they were introduced to the Americas as both a food source and a sport fish. Regrettably, they are seldom treated as either in this part of the world. While feeding, they root around the bottom, stirring up sediment, uprooting plants, and making the water murky. This reduces light penetration, which kills off aquatic vegetation and promotes harmful algae growth. Common carp are a large and an exceptionally hardy species. From a biological standpoint, these fish are actually extremely impressive, as they have mastered all the important means of fish survival. Everything from poor water tolerance to mass reproduction, and just an overall toughness to survive nearly any circumstance that they might encounter. As you can imagine, this makes them a nightmare invasive species as they are nearly impossible to eradicate. All of the carp species mentioned, including the Asian carp and the European carp, have a stigma of being inedible. But that's simply not true. The fact is that most of the world gladly eats these species, but there is a mindset in North American culture that they can't be eaten under any circumstance. Now I'm not implying that everyone should start feasting on carp, however I do think that in general we should try to have a more open mindset about eating these fish. The sad truth is that all of the fish species on this list are most likely permanent residents of North America for the rest of their existence. However, that doesn't mean that we can't do our part to help control the populations of these species as an effort to help preserve the native species of this wonderful continent. Hey everybody, this is Nathan. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Um, like I said at the beginning of the video, this is only part one. And so if you want to see part two, I suggest you subscribe. Um, that just helps me and it, of course it helps you watch all my content. So thank you so much and I hope to see you on the next one.